So last week I talked about this whole idea of these three stories that I was going to finish up this week. I decided no. Oh my gosh, there's anger. Karen, what? You're not going to finish the stories? What is wrong with you, Richard? We'll finish the stories later. Right now I want to focus on getting to those stories again. And to be able to reflect a little bit about it. When you're, when you're doing sermons, when you're prepping for stuff, you're like thinking of your story, right? So I'm thinking like my kids, all right? So my daughter, my daughter, Brianna, she is the oldest of my two, all right? Brianna, not to say that I'm older than this, but she is turning 30 years old in January. Isn't that weird? And Megan, you're up here going, I don't know, this program's like a decade or more old. Like when you were, she was in the ministry. She was in the youth ministry growing up here. And I'm thinking of you coming up and you did Change for Change, which has been well more than a decade. It's been a couple decades we've been doing that. And to think of the stories that have unfolded over time, my daughter, who's going to be turning 30 years old, she, she, she's like the time when I was coming back to the church. I'd walked away from the church for a while, and I'm coming back to the church, and we finally got to the place where we got to be able to have our first child, Brianna. Three, three years later, Nathan comes along, so he's going to be about 27. And I, I look at him, I'm like, oh, that's the moment when, when I, I talked to Linda about my calling to ministry. She was pregnant with Nathan, and I go to tell her, I'm like, you know, I've I've been wrestling with this. I, I, I think I'm called to ministry, and she grabbed her belly, and she goes, now? Now, because I had to go back to school. I had to go back to school in order to, and when I, when I tell you go back to school, I mean, I had dropped out of college after completing two classes, getting a B in one and a D in another from when I was young. And so I'm not about 10 years older. I was 12 years older then. And so I'm, I'm older and I've, it, everything changed. Everything changed. And she grabs that belly and says, now, is this the one? You're going back to school now. You're going to move our family now. But when you look at your stories, when you look at the stories of your life, that's part of the beauty is realizing that there's these moments where you're like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And there's other moments where you're going through and saying, oh, this is so hard. The thing that sort of caused the Brianna thing to pop into my head was uh, sitting down with Bonnie, who's our children's director. And I'm sitting down with her and she's got Phoebe. She's got her newborn baby with her, Phoebe, all right? And Phoebe comes to staff meetings and gives us directions on what we're supposed to do. I can't quite understand what she's saying. She speaks in tongues, right? So she's, she's up there, she speaks stuff and she's making those noises and coos and crying and, and purring like a little cute kitty cat, just awesome little one, right? And so I go to sit down in the office with her and Jen's there as well, who's our, our nursery director. And as I'm talking, Bonnie's on the floor with Phoebe. And Phoebe's just starting to get to the place where she's pushing up, pushing up, looking up like this. And I'm like, has she rolled over yet? And she's like, well, no, not yet, not yet. And so we were talking, I'm talking to Jen. I look back over and Phoebe was on her back. And so I, I'm like, oh my God, Bonnie, did she roll over? And she said, well, not on her own. Right, not on her own. I just gave her a little fish. She was starting to put it on like, boop, and she rolled over. It, but that's our story, right? This is sort of what we were talking about last week is we, we want to rush the things. We want to rush the things. We want to get on to the next thing. We, we want to get to the next stage with our kids. We want to be able to see them grow up and not realize that they're 30, therefore you're 24, right? So th- th- to realize that, 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 that all these stages that we want to rush so much, no. Part of the beauty is actually living in the midst of them right? You got the nine months from conception to birth. My wife was like, oh, I wish that I could have this child inside of me for 12 months. Yeah. Women, anybody? No, no, that's not really. Okay. Maybe she didn't say that, right? So nine months, nine months from birth to conception, right? And then you get, then you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait until they can push up. And then I can't wait till they roll over. But before they can get to the next step, they have to take the first step, right? So it's like they roll over, they have to do that before they can actually crawl, right? And before they can crawl, walk, they have to, to, to get through the crawling stage. And each time you're going through little processes, little steps along the way, little middle stories between the celebrations that happen at the end, and that there's these little celebrations, and sometimes we forget about them, right? We, we forget about the, the moments of celebration because we're so caught up in the stuff that's going on that we miss them, We miss them, but this is the story for students, for youth, right? You have to get a license, right? You want a license to be able to drive at some point. You have to go through the learner's permit stage first, right? 
right? So you, you get to ride with your parents with a big smile on your face. You're like, this is the best thing ever. Why are you shaking your heads? No, no, right? right? So you, they have to go through the learner's permit in order to get the license. They'll, they'll have to go for their first job if you haven't done that already. They're gonna have to go for their first interview and you have to get through the interview in order to get to the job. And there's the excitement of wondering, well, well I did, but I'm gonna get the job and there's the anxiety that goes with that. And it doesn't stop there. Once you get the job, you've got this little middle place where now you've got to learn how to do the job. So even if you've gone to school for a job, sometimes you're going to go on, you're going to have on the job training where you're going to learn how to actually do the specific job that you're called to do. I remember working at McDonald's. That was one of my first jobs, McDonald's, and, and going up for the first time to take an order and how terrified I was to go. And I had a person standing right next to me Sort of saying, you know, these are the buttons you push. This is what you have to do, right? So push these buttons. Or when I was working at Publix, learning how to bag groceries, all right? So they actually told you, how do you bag groceries? This, anybody remember paper bags? Yeah. Remember the day of paper bags? Weren't they awesome, right? The big old sturdy paper bags until they got wet, right? But the paper bags, you know, I could just flip them, right? I, could, I, I got so good with it. I was like, whoop, and the can would just go whoop, over the thing and it'd catch into the left hand. I'd put it in there and I could line all the heavy stuff on the bottom. And then you put the lighter stuff on the top and you throw it into the, but you had to learn how to do each one of those things. And what we do is we want to rush. We want to rush through everything every single moment, get the baby to roll over, get the baby to crawl, get the baby to be able to walk, get the baby out of diapers so we don't have to pay for diapers anymore. There's story after story that we rush through. And what we're looking at today is that place of saying, all right, we're going through that middle with the point of getting to those moments, to be able to celebrate at the end and to say, yes, she rolled over on her own. She rolled over on her own. And so today what we're doing is we're continuing to look at the story of Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai, because that's where we were at last week. And we're skipping all the way. So fast forwarding from the moment of the birth, not the birth, the promise, all the way to the birth. And we're doing that in one week's time. So here is the birth of Isaac from Genesis 21. The Lord, Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Did you hear it? Did you hear how old he is now? Anybody? How old is he? A hundred years old. And we talked about this last week. Sometimes the Bible's really weird. Okay, so we, we labeled that. We all said, sometimes the Bible is right? So sometimes it's weird. You look at stuff like, okay, so that means Sarah's 90, right? He's a hundred, she's 90 and she's bearing kids. That's a little weird. Okay. Set that aside for the moment. Focus on the fact of the promise. So when we talked last week, when they were leaving Haran, all right, so as they're getting ready to leave, they got the call from God and they're leaving Haran and he's leaving his family, his kindred, it says. He's going with his nephew Lot and his immediate family, but leaving behind the rest of the family, leaving behind his community. And they're going off to a land that he's heard that he's called to go to. That he's gonna be blessed to be a blessing, blessed to the blessing to the nations and to be able to walk that journey. And he does it. That's the story of Abraham. The story of Abraham is constantly having moments where he's called to faith and he believes and he actually follows through on the thing that he's supposed to do. But did you hear the emphasis? Did you hear the emphasis? Because one of the points of this particular passage of scripture is for us to be able to hear the emphasis. Three times something happens in that little passage of scripture and actually only in the very beginning of the scripture within the first verse or two, because it says this, the Lord dealt with Sarah, how? As he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah, what? As he had promised. We're supposed to get those little pieces. 
Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. When? At the time that God said, at the time that God has spoken, this is the time Abraham, about a, nine months before, he'd said, she's going to have that child and it's coming soon. And nine months later, it happens. The point we're supposed to be getting in this moment is the point that God is faithful at the time of which God has spoken. Do you hear it? God is faithful, which if that's the case, if that's the case, we need to hear Max Licata's words. Here's what he said. The question is not whether God will keep his promises, it's whether we will build our lives on them. Will we build our lives on promises that, that when you look at the story, how old was he? A hundred. How old was he at the beginning? Do you remember? 75. Say it louder, Adam. 75, 75 years old. What's that mean? Do the math. Between, between the time of the promise from God and the time of the fulfillment from God is 25 years. You guys are all mathematicians, right? 25 years it took from promise to fulfillment. 25 years. And we want stuff to be over like that. We want things to be solved like that. So why? Why is it that we have to go for this long? Why do, we, why do we have to go this far away? Why do we have to go from the promise, from the prayer, from the thing that we're doing? And sometimes we have to wait and we have to wait and we have to wait and we have to wait. And now many years later, 25 years later, you finally get the answer. So maybe the question for us, we don't have Abraham's uh, promise, right? We don't have that promise upon us. Any, anybody in here have the promise of Abraham upon you in the sense of he, God, will make you great. You will be a blessing to the nations. Anybody got that promise from God? Anybody? No? No? Just me? Yeah? Okay. No, not just, not just me and Abe. It's just Abe. It's just Abraham who got that promise. And maybe what we need to do is to be able to look into here and realize this is a book of promises. This is a book that, that, that points stuff out to us that helps us to be able to endure, to be able to get through, to realize that there is a distance between this and this quite often. Sometimes it's really short, but sometimes it takes a while for things to be able to develop. So here's some of the promises. Deuteronomy 31.6. This, this is the moment where, where Moses is, is now knowing he's not going into the promised land. All right, so he, he's, he's taught, taken Israel out of Egypt. He's taken them across the Red Sea. He's led them in the wilderness for 40 years. He's dealt with all the issues that they've got. He gets to the edge. He's not going to go into the promised land. And he says to them as he's going in there, y'all, y'all, Israel, that's right, Southern. He's from Southern Israel. He goes and shouts out to them, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. The Lord, your God goes with you. He, God, will never leave you nor forsake you, right? This is a promise. I promise you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I promise, I promise, if you are going through some stuff, if you're going through some difficulties, if you will come to me, I'm going to give you some rest. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. I promise, I promise that my peace can be with you no matter what it is that you're facing. And here's the thing, we've gone from, from one week's time, from promise to fulfillment. That's what we've done. We've done in one week's time what took 25 years of living, of waiting, of being in faith and walking faithfully forward and sometimes not even faithfully forward, sometimes failing in the midst of it. We don't get the full story because I went from one week to the next and left out almost the entire middle. So what are some of the things we miss? We miss the, 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 the departure of Lot, right? They, we miss Abraham telling Pharaoh that Sarai was his sister. Weird story. Separation from Lot, rescue of Lot, Hagar, Ishmael, God appearing to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, Sodom and Gomorrah. We miss all those stories because we just go from here to here in order to get to the end and to know God is faithful. And we think it's only in these big things when one of the points of this, I think, is to say is God is faithful through it all. God, God is faithful through, through the entirety of the story. 
That's why it doesn't go from chapter 12 to chapter 20. What would we at? 21, right? And just go boop and say, no, let's leave, leave out anything in between. The point is to be able to realize that God is present through all of this stuff, which means God is present when it comes to your story the same way. How do we get from here to here? The way we get from here to here is the same way that Abraham and Sarah does it. And we can't rush it and we don't want to. I want you to hear that again. We can't rush it and we don't want to. And that's weird to say because some of you guys, some of you are going through some stuff that you wish you could be through right now, that it was over, that you were able to move past it, that you didn't have the burden, the weight, the anxiety, the fear, whatever it is that you got, that that, that, that moment would just pass right now and that it would be gone when the reality is we're having to walk this story. So do you want to hear the end of the three stories from last week? Do you want to hear the end? Are you sure? You're confident you want to hear the end of last week's stories. Okay, all right. So story number one was gas, all right? Meaning gasoline, by the way. So gasoline, all right? So I'm driving up the interstate. I get on the phone with David Sneed. I'm talking. I look down. I've got 33 miles to go. So I'm just recapping last week. So if you weren't here last week, I told this part of the story last week. 33 miles to go. And I'm like, you know what? I'm hungry. So is my truck. I'm going to pull in and I'm going to grab some food and some gas. And because I'm a pastor, as I said, I went to Chick-fil-A. I went to Chick-fil-A, got my Chick-fil-A sandwich, got my French fries, got back on the road, started driving, still talking to David this whole time, driving down the road, hang up with David, pick up the phone again. I'm talking to my wife as I'm driving and look down and see that the range is zero on my truck, okay? So the range is zero. That's where we left off last week. The range is zero. I didn't run out of gas. All right, there you go. That's the end of the story. (laughs) The car crashed into the building across the street last week, two weeks ago now, right? So I was getting ready to do a memorial service. I was gonna be placing ashes out in the memorial garden for a family. Uh, We heard a crash. Their kids had been out here playing in the playground. That's when they heard the crash. They came in and told me. I run across the street, saw what happened. Um, There's people there that are trying to help the man. He's now out of the truck. He's laying on the ground, not too responsive. And I said, I'm going to run across and I'm going to get the AED. And I came running up. That's the, the device that sort of shucks you. So I ran across the street and I ran back over across the street. And just as I'm opening it up, I open up the device and it starts talking to you to tell you what steps you need to take. Right then, the fire department arrived. He lived. All right? The end of the story for the gun to my head. All right? So I'm working at McDonald's. I'm a manager at McDonald's, working down in St. Pete. Close the store, lock the doors. We do all our closing stuff. We get ready to go out. I'm getting ready to send the one person out in a car because there's no cell phones that are available because they don't exist, right? Because that's how old I am. Did I mention my daughter's 30 years old? All right, so I go out to unlock the door. I'm unlocking the door to let that person out. The dumpster's right in front of me with the wall around it in this particular store. And two people come running at me, one of them with a gun and they point the gun at me and say, do not shut the door. And I said, okay. And I let them in. And the crew is lined up in front of me. The person's got their neck around my their neck around my what? No, the hand around my neck. That's where I have anatomical problems, right? So arm around me, gun pointed to the back of my head like this as I'm looking at the crew. He didn't pull the trigger. Just in case you were wondering, that's the end of the story. <laughs> that's the end of the story, right? He didn't pull the trigger. No, that is the end of the story. What do you want, Judy? What do you want? Thank you. So thank you. So that's the, what, what, what happened, right? So what happened with the, after that moment, right? And what do you call it? The middle. You want the middle. Do you hear me? You want the middle. You want the middle of the story. We can't skip from here to here. We actually want to do this, but in reality, when I tell the story, you want the middle. You want to know what happened in that moment. You want to know that as I was driving my truck up the road and I didn't run out of gas, here's what was going through my head. I'm about to run out of gas. There's no exit nearby. I looked on the little Google screen. There's nothing there. Linda's getting anxious on the phone. 
Then I realized I'm driving my pickup truck, which likes gas. So it's not getting great gas mileage, but the good news is I'm driving my pickup truck. Guess what's in the back of my pickup truck? A gas canister. And suddenly the anxiety that I was feeling, once I realized it, anxiety gone. Anxiety gone. And I still was able to make it without that canister of gas. It was like this Elijah with the widow moment, if you know that story, where the flour doesn't run out and, and the oil doesn't run out. And I pulled in. I didn't even coast in. I revved my engine as I came into the gas station. And the whole time I had been praying to God with my hand up through the sunroof, but I don't have a sunroof. And I'm like, God, God of gas, fill my truck. Fill my truck like you fill me with the spirit, right? It got there. It got there. You want the middles of the story. You want the middle of the story from the, the, the gun moment, right? So I'm standing there, not with a neck here, a hand around my neck with a gun to my head and the crew's lined up in front of me. And I'm like 24, maybe 25 years old at this time. And I remember I just kept repeating the same thing over and over verbally to the person that's holding the gun to my head. Talk to me. Tell me what you want them to do, what you want us to do. I will tell them and we will do it. Talk to me. Tell me what you want us to do. I will talk to them and we will do it. With sort of a monotone feel, like just like that. I just kept saying it over and over again. Don't talk to them. I even told them one time, don't talk to them. Talk to me. I'll tell them what you want them to do and we'll do it. And so he said, I want you all to go into the, the back room. I said, guys, let's walk calmly. We'll walk back into the, the crew room. And so we slowly walk back into the crew room, lay down on the ground. Guys, everybody lay down on the ground. You, me, come with me. And I walked out with the person with the gun and I went into the office area. If you've ever, McDonald's, if you, the drive through at least back then you have the two window drive through in that hallway in between is the office. That's also where the safe is at. And so I remember going into that space and as I went in there and I knelt down to the safe and I'm unlocking it, I'm putting the combination in, I look off to my left and did I mention that there was two people there, right? So I've got the person with a mask and a gun over here. I look to my left and over here is probably a sixth or seventh grader with eyes this big, no mask on, terrified to even be there and be seeing what's going on, participating in the robbery. And I got mad. And as I'm doing this, I'm mad at this person over here. And I'm like, I get to the last number. And if you've ever done a safe, you know that you have to do this one more twist, right? And it sort of stops. And that's when you know you can swing the bar. And I looked up at him and this was the thought going through my head because I'm thinking he might hit me over the head with a pistol at this point. And if he does, I cupped my hand around the tumbler so that if I was hit, I would fall and I would lock the safe on him again. Instead, that didn't happen. I opened the safe, I stepped back and he got away with about three to $4,000 in money that night. And I've never seen or known who that person was. Again, I don't know the end result. That's the middle of the story all the way to the end. Sort of, sort of. Because I went home after all the police report time. And when I went there, Linda's there. And I can still feel at that time, I could still feel like a burning sensation. You want, your mind does weird stuff. At least mine does. I could feel where the gun was, like a burning sensation right into my head. And it caused me when I'm doing that to, to sort of like get to this place of what, what just happened? What just happened? And then I realized later in retrospect, it sort of impacted the rest of my life because it caused me to realize in, in your life, you need to expect the unexpected. You need to know that the things that, that, that you can't imagine can happen, can happen. And how will you handle that moment? 
And you don't know until the moment arises. I didn't know I would be calm in that moment. I didn't know that would happen. I didn't, how I'd react, how I'd handle the situation. It caused me to look at life differently in my 20s. To be able to look into the eyes of my wife in a different way. To commit to her in a different way. To realize that, that life truly can be short that it can be gone in a flash. And therefore, what do I do with the time that I've got? How do I live moving forward? We're meant, guys, we're meant to see the entire 25 years. We're meant to live the 25 years and to realize that in the midst of that, it has a purpose. All those moments when you're going through struggle, they have a purpose. They're, they're messy, yes. They're hard, but, but they're also necessary and helpful. Sue Monk, kid, put it like this in her book, When the Heart Waits. When you're waiting, you're not doing nothing. You're doing the most important something there is. You're, you're allowing your soul to grow up. If you can't be still and wait, you can't become what God created you to be. If you can't wait in the midst of the storms of life, you can't be who God called you to be. And I don't know what circumstances you are going through now. I don't know what circumstances you've faced in the past. I don't know what you're going to face in the future, but that speaks. It speaks. Our life, our life, it's not just a, like made up of one big story. Our life is made up of multiple little stories that take place over time. And my hope is that you can, you can take your life, there's a thing called a lifeline where you draw your life and you say, what, what, what's the things that happen in my life? What's the bad things? What's the good things that have happened in my life? And you draw it and you've got the down moments. And so for me, it was, you know, birth and I'm the fourth of four children. I'm the only boy. Please have sympathy for me, right? So I've got three older sisters and at five years old, my parents went through a divorce and my stepmother came to live with us. And so I, the divorce, the, the stepmother coming in, new mom, weirdness, the, the shuffling back and forth, weirdness. I was, ended up becoming very close though to both my step parents, to my stepmom, Gloria, and to my stepdad at that time, Jim. And Jim ended up having a stroke when I was in middle school. And I loved Jim. And in the midst of that stroke, a fire broke out in the house in the, the washing machine or the dryer, I can't remember which. Um, that seemed to be the final incident that caused him to, to pass. And I remember going to the funeral. And so I, I can picture this, but I can also picture moments where uh, I met Linda, you know, and she's, she's the first girl I dated but didn't become the only girl I dated, but became the last girl that I dated because I married her, right? And there's so many things you can do to be able to draw and to realize when you look back over the course of that life to say, just what this says, God's there. God is there. And maybe sometimes if you're going through a difficult moment right now, it's an opportunity for you to maybe look back and say, you know what? I've been through some difficult spots along my life's journey already. And I can look back and I realize God was there. Maybe even in the midst of the moments, I didn't realize God was there. But in retrospect, I can look and I can say, when I wasn't attending church, when I wasn't active in my faith, when I was working at McDonald's and a gun was pointed at my head, there was things out of that story that changed my life. God was there. And when it comes to your life, same thing. Shall we pray? God, help us. Help us to live in this moment. But also help us to be able to maybe turn backwards in our life, to, to look at our story, to do our lifeline. And to be able to see the places where, where life was hell but also God to be able to see where there was a great celebration. Maybe even to remember some of the smaller moments in between. Moments when we were in a high school cheering 
I've got spirit. Yes, I do. I've got spirit. How about you? A little small moment that suddenly can make a difference. That can bring a smile to our face. Help us to see and remember those stories from our past. Help us to live in this moment, whatever it is, good or difficult, and to know you are here. You have a history of being here for us, a history of being here for me. And for each one of us to say, for me, God has been there. So as we turn and we look to the future and we walk in that direction, that confidence is with us. This part of our story is only a part of our story. And there's still stories yet to unfold that make up the story of our life. We thank you, God, for being present in all of it. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all say, amen. When you build your life on the promises of God, there's one thing I can guarantee you. Well, two things. One, God is with you. Two, you change. You become somebody different. That's in the broader story of Abraham and Sarai, right? That's their story. Their names literally get changed from Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. That happens in the middle of the journey, not at the end. They are the people of faith. The same thing happens with us. When you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and Jeremy and I, we might lay our hands upon you, but before we do that, we turn and we say, what name shall be given, right? When you were doing it for a baby, what name shall be given to this child? Or what is your name? And you say first name, middle name. You don't say last name. It's because your identity is being changed. You are Richard Douglas Christian. And you have a new identity. And that identity carries you forward through the ups and the downs, knowing that it's all in the palm of God and the promises that he commits to for me and for you. Go live a blessed, messy, beautiful, peace-filled life. Amen.